Galatians 3, verses 15 to 22. I've put the verses on the screen today. Uh, but you will find them, of course, in the Blue Bible. Um, that would be on page number 1160. Thank you. 11, 1170. Thank you. 1170. Perfect. Is that little section titled, subtitled, The Law and the Promise? Let me read these words to you. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant, like a will, for example, that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later than the promise, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance, which is to say all the good things we receive from Jesus, all the blessings of Jesus, if the inheritance depends on the law, on keeping the law, then it no longer depends on the promise, on believing the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. So the promise remains in place. We'll, go, we'll say more about that. Quite complicated, this one, isn't it? But you have to... We'll, we'll work through it, don't worry, in a few moments. Well, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions, because of sin. Until the seed... That's Jesus, verse 16. Until the seed to whom the promise referred, had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator, it's Moses. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. That's hard to understand. We'll say more about that in a minute. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, that could give life, spiritual life, then righteousness, a right relationship with God, would certainly have come by the law. But it didn't because that could never work. Verse 22, But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised to Abraham in the beginning, Genesis 12, 15, 17, so that what was promised, being given through faith in, in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Let's pray for help. Father, we pray for your help. We thank you that you have promised uh, that as we reflect on these things, that you will give us insight and so help us to use our minds and to love you with our minds now as we uh, concentrate and focus and think through the meaning of these words and the meaning of, uh, of them for us today and how they might apply to our own lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Kurt Zuma became a household name last week for the wrong reason. I guess some of you know what that was. He was the guy who kicked his cat. The West Ham player, who played just over here a few nights ago, every time he got the ball, he was booed by his own fans too, I think. It's wrong to kick a cat, clearly. It's even more wrong, or certainly stupid, 
to share that on social media. He's certainly something that he regrets, and his brother. However, without excusing what he's done in any shape or form, the truth is we've all done bad things. You may not have kicked a cat. You may have kicked a cat. We've all said bad things, especially in our private lives that others just don't see. And what's more, of course, and the Bible really zooms in on this, doesn't it? Our thoughts, the thoughts of our hearts, the desires of our hearts can be especially wicked, can be especially bad, can be especially corrupt. We have all lied. We have all lost our temper. We have all lusted, probably. We have all disobeyed our parents. And we have all failed to put God first in our lives, to love and honor Him with our whole hearts. And that's something we've done again and again. We have broken God's laws. And we have broken His heart. That's very clear. We all stand before the law of God, guilty and condemned. We are lawbreakers who deserve his punishment. How then can we be right with God? That's really what righteousness means in the book of Galatians. Right with God. How can we have a right standing with God? A right relationship with God? When our lives are so wrong. It's, it's the burning question, really, isn't it, of, of this whole letter, of the whole Bible, of life itself. How can I be right with God? A perfect, holy God. Because I have sinned, I have failed, I have broken His law, I have rebelled against Him. I deserve in myself nothing but His wrath, His anger, His punishment, His condemnation. The law of God makes that very clear to us all. It's the burning question. If it's not the burning question in your heart, if other questions are bigger than that, or hotter than that, be sure there will come a day when it will be. I just hope and pray that that's not the day of judgment. There are only two possible ways for us to be right with God. You do it yourself, or you have it done for you. We've seen very clearly in Galatians, and in Romans, and throughout the Bible, that we cannot do it ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right with God. We cannot make up for the things that we've done that have broken His law and broken His heart. We cannot do it through keeping the law, through anything that we do ourselves. We just cannot do it. I cannot change my evil heart. I cannot atone for my sins. Because I've broken His law and I still break it. This is where grace comes in and is such wonderful news. Grace means that God does it for us. That He saves us. That He makes us right with Him. Forgives us. And so on and so forth. All the blessings of Christ. That goes right back to the promise that was given to Abraham back in Genesis 12. And Paul will talk about that promise, and he'll talk about the law that came later through Moses. So Abraham and later Moses. And a question that he'll deal with, you can see in verse 19, is, well, why then was the law given at all? If the promise remains in place, what is the point of the law? If it could never achieve righteousness, if it could never give us life, spiritual life, and it could never make us right with God. 
or maybe more accurately, if we could never achieve righteousness with it because we are too sinful and too mired in sin, why, why did he give the law at all if it was just going to fail in that respect? That's one of the questions in this section, and we'll see his answer in a few moments. But the first question is, does the law set aside? Does the law of Moses set aside the original promise of blessing given to Abraham back in Genesis 12, re repeated in 15 and 17. Has the promise been cancelled or changed or added to in some way with the coming of the law? So that's the first question. So I just need to, there we are. That's fine. Well, some years ago, a woman uh, willed all her worldly goods. I've just got a problem with my connection here. Sorry. That's, that's it. Okay. <laughs> all her worldly goods to a particular college, possibly a Christian college, I'm not sure. When her children discovered this after her death, they were livid. They were really angry. They felt the college had manipulated her, had taken advantage of an old lady. So they contested the will in court. They argued that the worldly goods applied to her personal effects, but not her real estate, not her, her home and so forth. The children lost the case because they could do nothing to change the terms of the, of the will, the ratified will. The will was airtight. It was unchangeable. That is true of a human will, isn't it? A human covenant, a human agreement. That is exactly Paul's point in verse 15. Get there in a minute. God's promises are unchangeable, they are airtight. Irrevocable would be the fancy word. This is a will or testament, a covenant. Means a last will and testament. It's the same word that is used for that. And it is beyond any legal challenge. Any change or addition. God's promise to Abraham or his promises, and the both phrases are used, promises and promise, they're unchangeable. They stand, they remain. And these promises have now come true in Jesus. That's the point of verse 16. The promises, verse 16, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And Paul points out that the seed refers to one person who is Christ. Jesus Christ is the one referred to in the promise. The promise of blessing will come true, would come true, has come true, in Jesus Christ. Verse 16. In verse 17, he makes the point that the law came much later. Here, 430 years later. There's some interesting maths going on there. We haven't got time to go into it now. But much clearly, much later, the law came along with Moses. After the Exodus, the people were given the law on Mount Sinai. And it came after the promise. The promise came first. It does not set aside that original promise made to Abraham and fulfilled in Jesus. That's what he says. What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later after the promise, does not set aside, does not annul, does not cancel or change in any way the covenant previously established, the arrangement, the agreement, the promise previously established by God with Abraham and thus do away with the promise. The promise remains intact. It is not taken out by the law of Moses. And some of the people that Paul was dealing with wanted to say, that it had, that you still needed the law in place. 
Otherwise, you could never be right with God. That actually the law had cancelled to some extent or changed or added to the promise. So then the inheritance, which is simply to say the blessings that we receive in Christ through the promise, all the good things we receive, forgiveness of sin, salvation, justification, being right with God, all of these good things, all of that inheritance which we receive now, but even more so in the age to come, if that depended on the law, he said, if it depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. The point is that it does not depend on the law, but it does simply depend on the promise. Because then he says, but God in his grace, because this is sheer grace, kindness that we've never deserved, God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise or as a promise. So the promise stands, the promise remains, it's not been annulled, it's not been cancelled, it's not been changed by the coming of the law much later. So then the question comes, doesn't it, in 19. Why then was the law given at all? I think the simple answer is to show up our sin. We're told, aren't we, it was added because of transgressions. Transgressions is like trespasses. It's when you cross a line, you, 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 trespass, you, you trespass on somebody else's land, for example, uh, and you've crossed a line, you're in trouble, uh, you've broken a law. Well, transgressions means sins, doesn't it, therefore? It was added because of transgressions until... The seed, now remember the seed is Jesus, verse 16, to whom the promise referred, that's Jesus, had come. The law shows up our sin. We know this, don't we? Laws do that. They show us where we've gone wrong. We may have a feeling that we've done something wrong. I guess when Kurt Zuma kicked, drop-kicked his cat, he had a feeling that it was wrong, but he was maybe having a bit of a laugh with his brother, mucking around. But now he knows for sure everybody's laid down the law, haven't they? It's wrong to kick a cat. How could you do such a thing? Well, wrong was always wrong, even before the law came. But the law clarifies the issue, doesn't it? It makes it very, very clear what is right and what is wrong. A written law makes it more clear than ever. I just use another little illustration. Um, it, it seems, I, I can't imagine who this could be of all the groups that use the church, but it seems that someone may have been smoking in the ladies' toilet uh, and hiding the butts under a potty. I find it hard to believe, but there you are. Now that's wrong, of course, and pr presumably the person, if there's somebody doing that, they, they know that that's wrong. But now I've put a sign up. i put the law, I've laid down the law, I've pinned up the law on the wall that simply says, please do not smoke in here or anywhere else in the building. So there's a law. So imagine that person, if there is somebody doing this, and, and, I, and I can't imagine who it would be, but imagine that person seeing that now as they walk in. They knew it was wrong before, but it clarifies the issue, doesn't it? It makes it much more clear. They're clearly breaking a rule. And the law does that. It shows us our sin more clearly than ever before. Specific sins that break God's law. We have lied. We have disobeyed our parents. We have failed to love the Lord our God with our whole hearts. And therefore we are liable to his punishment under the law. That's what the law does for us. It shows up our sin in very clear terms. Verses, uh, um, the end of that verse and then verse 20 are quite hard to understand, I think. And we wonder why that's been thrown in here. And I think it's kind of, if you can imagine, I think they're kind of in brackets. And they're showing again the superiority of the promise to the law. How the law, how the promise is better and permanent, whereas the law had a temporary uh, function. In some ways it still has a function. Uh, and we'll say more about that in a minute. But I think this is kind of in brackets 
uh, between uh, the end of 90 or the 19, the first part of 19 and 21. What does he mean? Well, uh, as I say here, the, the promise is superior or better than the law because it came direct to Abraham from God. Whereas the law, what happened? It was mediated. It came through a mediator. It came indirect through angels and indeed through Moses. So it didn't come direct from God. The dealings of God were direct, weren't they, with Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. You remember how he cuts a covenant. Uh, and this is the, the second point, really. The second point is that the promise depended. The promise to Abraham depended only on God. It was one-sided. Most arrangements are between two parties. They're two-sided. You keep your part of the bargain, I'll keep mine. God's covenant, his arrangement, uh, his uh, agreement with Abraham was one-sided. Abraham fell into a deep sleep whilst God walked between the pieces of the, the animals that were split in two, a sign that uh, if you don't keep this covenant, uh, this is what will happen to you. Normally, both parties would walk through, walk that path through these pieces of dead animal. Sounds a bit gruesome, but that's how it was done. That's why it's called cutting a covenant. But when Abraham and God, or when God gave his promises and his covenant to Abraham, God alone walked the path through. God alone cut the covenant. It was one-sided. Unilateral would be the fancy word. It wasn't, it did not depend on Abraham in any shape or form on what he did, on his performance. It does not depend on us in any shape or form. It depends only on God, which is very good news for us, because we would mess it up. So it depends only on God, whereas the law, of course, was dependent on both parties. You must obey if you want to be blessed. The promise was superior and remains in place and has not been altered or cancelled by the coming of the law later on. So it's quite complicated, but we're getting there. I hope you're getting there with me. So now in verse 21, Paul wants to be very clear. He's told us in Romans that the law of God is holy and good. It's a good thing. It's not, it's not an enemy in many respects. It does condemn us. But it remains the holy law of God. And it is not therefore opposed to the promise of God. Absolutely not is what he says. He uses a very strong expression. Some uh, versions have used the expression, God forbid. Um, absolutely not is a good expression too. It is not against the promise. In fact, it serves the promise. It supports the promise. The law is subordinate. It is under the promise in a sense, and it serves the promise. How so? Well, it leads us to the promise. It paves the way for Christ, for the gospel. As we see our wickedness, that we are lawbreakers, that we don't have a leg to stand on, that we have no hope without Christ, without the gospel, without the promise. We run to him. You can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin. It's as if we're imprisoned by sin. We know that, don't we, deeply, even if we don't have particular addictions. It's true of us all that outside of Christ, we are slaves to sin. Everyone who sins, said Jesus, is a slave to sin. Scripture has locked up everything under the control or the imprisonment of sin so that what was promised, this grace in Jesus being given through faith in Jesus and received by faith, might be given to those who believe. It's very clear, isn't it, that the way to receive this 
what he calls an inheritance in, in, in 18. Um, what he else where calls grace and all kinds of other expressions is by simple faith, simply believing. You see, a law requires obedience. And the moment you fail to obey and you disobey, that's it. You've broken the law. But a promise only requires belief or faith or trust. It's wonderfully simple for us, isn't it? Although even then we need the Lord to help us. So that's, I think that's kind of the shape of the, the argument there. Let, let me just press on to what I hope... Um, uh, yes, the, the, the promise requires only faith. Not keeping the law spotlessly, perfectly, from day one to the end of your life. That would be required for you to be right with God. For you to be saved. For, well, for you to achieve or reach glory and eternal life, which we cannot, of course, do. That the promise requires only faith. Simple, humble faith. Coming to Him, running to Him, throwing ourselves at his feet, embracing him by faith. Well, so what? It's all come up at once. It wasn't meant to, but there you are. We can still use the law. The law still has a use for us. Like that sign in the lady's toilet. Or, or perhaps uh, Kurt Zuma on uh, uh, social media. We see where we've gone wrong. We see where we've stepped over the line or where we've fallen short of the line or where we've missed the mark. And we've simply failed to be the people he made us to be. Or when we've deliberately disobeyed him. And the law shows us that more clearly than ever. And so the Ten Commandments or something like it could be really helpful to show you your failure and Sounds like a weird thing to say, doesn't it? To show us our sin. The Bible compares this to a mirror, doesn't it, in James chapter 1. It's like looking in a mirror and seeing the, the problem. The problem. I saw I had a bit of um, toothpaste around my mouth this morning. I was in the toilet a few minutes ago. I just got it off. You need to look into the mirror of the law to see what you're truly like. Now that brings us down, of course, doesn't it? We, we don't want to stay there. That brings us down. We see our failure before God. The holy standards of God. But then, of course, it's meant to drive us, isn't it? We see that here, don't we? It's meant to lead us, to drive us, I'd say, perhaps better, to the promise in Jesus. To come to him and fall at his feet and trust him as our saviour. And that lifts us up like never before. So a sick man who goes to the doctor gets the diagnosis. It's not good. He is truly sick. That's bad news. He's depressed. But that also leads him to the, the treatment, the healing. There's an A&E. There's somewhere you can go to get better. Now he could pretend he's not sick. Some men do that. They don't like the thought of going to the doctor. And he could, he could just go on suffering more and more, and it gets worse and worse until he dies. It's possible to live in denial of, a, of an illness, of your true condition. Or he can face up to his problem. He can go to the doctor. He can get the diagnosis. He can go to the law. He can get the diagnosis. I'm a sinner. I'm in trouble. I'm in danger of the fire of hell. And he can get treated by that doctor. Doctor who is the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope it's not you. I hope that you're not living in denial of your sin. That you are a lawbreaker. And that what you desperately need more than anything is not a better job, a better relationship, better Wi-Fi, but you need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need his salvation. It's not easy to admit we are sick. And it's not easy to admit we are sinners. 
But if we don't admit it, if we don't come clean, we'll never be clean. And we'll just get sicker and sicker until we die. The law helps us to see how sick we are, how sinful we are, so that it can then lead us to Jesus for salvation, for healing. So look to the law. Use the law to show up your sin. Go back to the Ten Commandments. Go through them. Go to Matthew 5 and look at how Jesus uses two of those commandments. If you've looked lustfully at a woman, that's adultery, spiritual adultery. If you got really angry and lost it in a hateful, bitter way, that's spiritual murder. You and I are guilty of those things. That should terrify us to some extent. But make sure you also look to Jesus. That promise that came true in him is for you, for us all. Only Jesus can give you righteousness. Only Jesus can give you life. Right standing with God. So let's appreciate that promise in Jesus. The law brings us down, right down, doesn't it? Perhaps down more than we ever want to go, but the gospel lifts us up higher than ever. And we see that all of our sins are cancelled and cleared, washed away, and through him we are right with God. We have peace with God. The promise of blessing in Jesus is a wonderful thing. But let's say a little bit more about that as we close. What is the particular blessing that we are promised in this part of the Bible? Well, we just back up one verse to verse 14. The promise that was fulfilled in Jesus is the promise of the Holy Spirit for our hearts and lives. That's what Jesus gives us. That's who Jesus gives us, I must say. He gives us his Spirit. That's the blessing. That's the inheritance. And though it's only one gift as such, it's the blessing through which all our blessings come to us. When God gives us his Holy Spirit, we receive all the spiritual blessings of Christ. For example, just looking a bit further into Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, having the Spirit means that we feel, we experience being children of God. We feel, you see, I think Jesus is the one who makes us the children of God. He gives us the right, John 1, verse 12, to be called children of God, but it's the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit who who makes us feel like we're children of God, who gives us that experience. So he's the one, chapter 4, verse 6, who calls out, Abba, Father, in our hearts, and we feel the love of the Father for us, and that our God is our Father, even our Abba, Father. And then we go forward a little bit further, and we see another blessing of the Spirit in our lives in chapter 5, verse 5, it's through the Spirit that we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. And here I think he's, he's looking ahead to the day of, of judgment and the righteousness that will be credited to us on that day because of Jesus. And it's the Spirit who helps us. One of the great functions, one of the great roles of the Holy Spirit in Scripture is to inspire hope in us, help us to look forward to that day. Fills our hearts with hope. There it is in Galatians 5, 5. It's through the Spirit that this happens. And then, of course, as we go further into chapter 5, we know, don't we, about the fruit of the Spirit. We know a song about that. I'll spare you from that right now. But coming soon, I'm sure, to a screen near you, we'll have that song again. And we remember these lovely words, don't we? Um, we're going to stick with patience, not forbearance. It's love, joy, peace. It's patience, kindness, goodness. It's faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruit 
not the fruits actually, but the fruit, the one fruit of the Spirit. They all belong together. And these are the things, the qualities that the Holy Spirit is working and producing in our lives, maybe very gradually like fruit, which normally is a very gradual growth. But that's what he's working at. So isn't it wonderful to have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives? And then finally, Galatians 6, verse 8, another reference to the Spirit. And it's from the Spirit, he says, that we will reap eternal life. We reap eternal life, life that is truly life, as Paul says in another of his letters, and life to the full, as Jesus calls it in John 10, verse 10. These are wonderful gifts and blessings that come with the Holy Spirit. So you can see that having the Holy Spirit opens you to all the blessings of God in Christ. All the good things earned by Christ, by His blood, sweat, and tears, the reward that He received for His life of perfect righteousness and His death on the cross for our sins, these all come to us directly by the Holy Spirit. If I may, I don't know if this is a good comparison, uh, but yesterday there was a big birthday party here for Alana in the back hall there. Great fun. One of the highlights of the party, apart from the chocolate fountain, of course, was the piñata. Now, with the, a piñata is a single thing, right? There it is hanging on the, um, the clothes uh, rack, and uh, that, that's how we did it. But as you open it up, or as it opens up, what do you get? You get lots of sweets pouring out, and then the kids are all over the floor. <laughs> it's a bit like, I hope it's not irreverent to compare the Holy Spirit to a piñata, but the sweets that pour out of a piñata are like the blessings that come, the sweet blessings that come with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now here's something we need to do again and again, don't we? This is not something we do once just at the beginning of Christian life. Andy pointed this out very forcefully last, last Sunday, very helpfully. We need to keep going back to first principles, keep going back to the, the, the origins, the, the basics of, of sin and salvation, the gospel. It's the driving force of our hearts and lives. It's the thing that's meant to motivate us. We love because he first loved us. We give because of all he's given to us. We are to be humble like Jesus humbled himself. We are to forgive because we have been forgiven. So we go back again and again to Christ, to his cross, the promise in Jesus. Whether you've been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years. And I wonder if a good way for us to express this or to deal with this is to pray it out. So I've put together a little prayer that I'm going to invite you to say with me in a moment. And uh, it's a very, very simple prayer about sin and salvation. And if it's a prayer from your heart, if it's a prayer that you can pray and mean it, it will be a true prayer. And God willing, it will be a, an effective prayer. So here's the prayer. Actually, it's going to come up line by line. And we're just going to pause and take a moment to think about each line and say the words together. So I invite you to say them with me. You're, of course, free not to if you prefer not to. But I invite you to join with me and say, God, have mercy on me. I have broken your law. I am a sinner. I need you to forgive and make me right with you. I believe in your promise in Jesus. I believe that he loved me and gave himself for me. I believe that he alone can make me right with you. 
and he can give me the Holy Spirit. And all the good things that come with him. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.